error and it will tackle health inequalities. And Mr Speaker, we're also delivering dentistry to our most remote regions without delay. This year, we will deploy dental vans to more isolated rural and coastal areas. Staffed by NHS dentists, they will offer checkups and simple treatments like fillings. This model has been a tried and tested success across many regions. For example, last year in Cornwall, a mobile van visited five harbours and treated more than 100 fishermen and their families. We will be rolling out, uh, out up to 15 vans across Devon, Gloucestershire, Somerset, Norfolk, Suffolk, Lincolnshire, Cambridgeshire, Dorset, Cornwall, North Yorkshire and Northamptonshire. This move has been welcomed by Healthwatch, the Nuffield Trust and the College of General Dentistry. And we will let patients know when vans will be in their area so they can get the care they need faster. Mr Speaker, these reforms will empower NHS dentists to treat more than a million uh, people and deliver two and a half million more appointments. Just as the CEO of National Voices, a group of major health and care charities, has said, this extra money should help thousands of people who have been unable to see a dentist in the last two years to get the care they need. And these reforms are just the beginning. This recovery plan will also drive forward reforms to make NHS dentistry sustainable for our children and our grandchildren. Which brings me to the second pillar, (coughs) growing and upskilling our workforce for the long term. Our long term workforce plan, the first in NHS history, gives us strong foundations on which to build. By 2031, training places for dentists will increase by 40 per cent, four zero per cent. And places for dental hygienists and therapists who can perform simple tasks such as fillings will also rise by 40 per cent. More dentists and more dental therapists will mean more care for NHS patients. And I'm delighted to tell the House today that we are going further in three key ways. First of all, we will consult on a tie-in to NHS work for dentistry graduates, because right now too many are choosing to deliver private work over valuable NHS care. More than 35,000 dentists in England are registered with the General Dental Council, but last year almost a third worked exclusively in the private sector. Training these dentists is a significant investment for taxpayers, and they rightly expect it to result in the strongest possible NHS care. That's why this spring we will launch a consultation on a tie-in for graduate dentists and how this could deliver more NHS care and better value for taxpayers. Secondly, we will take full advantage of our dental professional skills. Today, even though they have the right training, without written direction from a dentist, dental therapists cannot do things such as administer antibiotics. This year, we will change this, making life simpler for dentists and making care faster for patients. As the President of the College of General Dentistry has said, the use of the full range of skills of all team members will enable the delivery of more care and make NHS dentistry more attractive to dental professionals. Thirdly, we will recruit more international dentists to the NHS. We have a plan to do this by working with the General Dental Council to get more international dentists taking exams, to get them onto the register sooner and to explore the creation of a new provisional registration status, so that under the supervision of a dentist who's already on the register, highly skilled international dentists can start treating patients sooner rather than working as hygienists while they're waiting to join the register. And turning now to our plan's third pillar, which is prioritising prevention and giving children a healthy smile for life. This begins by supporting parents to give their children the best possible start. That is why family hubs up and down the country will offer parents-to-be expert advice on looking after their baby's teeth and gums. And as they grow up, we will support parents and nurseries to make brushing their teeth part of every child's routine before they start primary school. Because the evidence is clear. The earlier good habits are built, the longer they will last. And seeing a dentist regularly 
is also vitally important for children's health. Since the pandemic, too many have been unable to do this. And this is why this year we are taking care directly to children. We will deploy mobile dental teams to schools in areas with a shortage of NHS dentists. They will apply preventative fluoride varnish to more than 165,000 reception age children's teeth, strengthening them early and preventing decay. Yeah, yeah. And Mr Speaker, our Smile for Life programme has already been endorsed by the College of General, Den uh, General Dentistry. Mr Speaker, six million people in England already benefit from water fluoridation. And to go further to protect children's teeth, we will consult on strengthening more of our country's water with fluoride. Again, the evidence is clear. In some of the most deprived parts of England, enhancing fluoride levels could reduce the number of teeth extracted because of decay by up to 56%. Yeah, yeah. That is why, through the Health and Care Act, we have made it simpler to add fluoride to more of our water supply. And as a first step this year, we will launch a consultation to expand water fluoridation across the North East, an expansion that would give 1.6 million more people access to water that strengthens their teeth, Absolutely. preventing Brilliant. tooth decay Brilliant. and tackling inequality. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this is our Government's plan to recover and reform dental care. Yeah. Dental training places up 40%. Two and a half million more appointments, <laughs> dental vans treating more patients, more dentists in remote areas, more dentists taking on NHS patients, better support for families and better care for children, patient access up, inequity coming down, making life simpler and treatment faster and fairer for patients and staff. Mr Speaker, we have taken the difficult decisions and we have delivered now a long-term plan to make dental care faster, simpler and fairer for people across yeah, the country. Yeah. We are going to get on with the job and put our plan into action. I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Shadow Secretary of State, Wes Streety. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I wholeheartedly associate my uh, and myself and my party with the remarks of the Secretary of State and sending our best wishes to His Majesty the King and having gone through a cancer diagnosis myself, particularly his family, uh, for whom it is often more difficult than the person receiving the diagnosis. And in the generous spirit in which we have begun, can I thank the Health Secretary for accidentally emailing me her entire plan yesterday. It was above and beyond the courtesy we normally expect. <laughs> And in that spirit, I look forward to receiving her party's election manifesto any day now. Of course, we'll have to write ours first to give them some inspiration. Mr Speaker, after 14 years of Conservative government, NHS dentistry is in decay. Eight in ten dentists are not taking on new patients. In the south-west of England, the figure is 99 per cent. One in ten people have been forced to attempt DIY dentistry, Dickensian conditions, because they can't see an NHS dentist and they can't afford to go private. Order. Mr. Beck. No, I'm sorry, but you did a little bit earlier. I don't want any more heckling from you. I, was, I want everybody, quite rightly, to listen to the Secretary of State except the same for the Shadow Secretary of State, West Street. Oh, don't worry, Mr. Speaker, I'll come back to the PPS shortly. Tooth decay is the number one reason for children aged 6 to 10 being admitted to hospital. And unbelievably, there have been reports of Ukrainian refugees booking dentist appointments back home and returning for treatment because it is easier to fly to a war-torn country than it is to see an NHS dentist in England. Well, Mr Speaker, at least there's one government policy that get, that's getting flights off the ground because it's certainly not their Rwanda scheme failure. And, Mr Speaker, let's look at the human consequences of this Conservative tragedy. Labour's candidate in Great Yarmouth, Keir Cousins, told me about Jeanette a young woman in her 30s who has struggled with gum and mouth problems all her life. She used to be able to get treatment. Now she can't find an NHS dentist in all of Norfolk to take her. She can't afford to go private. It hurts to smile. It hurts to laugh. The pain is so great, Jeanette doesn't go out anymore. And just this week, Jeanette resorted to trying to remove her own tooth. This isn't right for anyone of any age, but Jeanette should be in the prime of her life. 
So will the Secretary of State apologise to Jeanette and the millions like her for what the Conservatives have done to NHS dentistry? Yeah. After 14 years of neglect, cuts and incompetence, the Government has today announced a policy. More appointments, recruiting dentists to the areas most in need, toothbrushing for children. It sounds awfully familiar, Mr Speaker. By adopting much of Labour's rescue plan for dentistry, doesn't it just show that the Conservatives are out of ideas of their own and they are looking to Labour to fix the mess they have made? And next time Conservative ministers say Labour doesn't have a plan or Labour's plan isn't credible, don't believe a word of it. And of course, Mr Speaker, there are some differences between our two parties' approaches. Labour is pledging an extra 700,000 extra urgent and emergency appointments, additional to the appointments announced today. Can the Health Secretary confirm that the Government's plan doesn't provide any additional emergency support? Labour proposed supervised toothbrushing for early years. Conservative MPs accused it of being nanny state. Does the Health Secretary stand by that label, or does she now support children under five being supported to brush their teeth? And, Mr Speaker, the key difference is this. We recognised our plan was a rescue plan, and that to put NHS dentistry back on its feet, immediate reform of the dental contract is needed. Without this, this is a plan that is doomed to fail. And don't just take my word for it. The British Dental Association have said this plan won't stop the exodus of dentists from the NHS, it won't provide a dentist for every patient who needs one, and it won't put an end to this crisis. And coming to the miserable script of the PPS and the whips that spreading it round the table, if it is really the case that Labour's contract is to blame, then why haven't they reformed it for 14 years, and why aren't they reforming it now? Because, Mr Speaker, in 2010 the Conservatives promised in its election manifesto to reform the dental contract. They're not just bringing back Lord Cameron, they're bringing back his broken promises. And, Mr Speaker, people have been desperately trying to get dental care for years, and there was nothing from the Conservative Party. But now we're in an election year, they're trying to kick the can down the road, scramble for a plan. They only discover their heart when they fear in their heart for their own political futures. And the consequences consequences have been seen around the block in Bristol. Finally, Mr Speaker, the Secretary of State is promising reform after 2025, after the next general election. Who is she trying to kid? After 2025, the Conservatives will be gone, and if they're not, yeah, yeah. NHS dentistry will be. How many more chances do they expect? How many more broken promises? 2010, 2015, 2017, 2019. Mr Speaker, their time is up, and it's time for Labour to deliver the change this country needs. Well, Mr Speaker, I tried to give, help him by giving him advance copy of...